بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأفضل التسليم على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الموت رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وتحقينا إذا علمتنا And the question about Asbab al-Nuzul or about Malki al-Madani. Shall we move to another subject speaking about that, Sheikh al-Mansur? Bearing in mind that this is, even though it's too important for Qur'an, but it's not special for, specific for Qur'an, you may have that, Sheikh al-Mansur, in the Sunnah and Nabuwa al-Mutahara, also the tradition of the Prophet And that's why this is very important for both aspects of it, you know, to know it, the most uh, uh, apparent, you know, evidence of it was mentioned in Quran, ما ننسخ من آية أو ننسها نأتي بخير منها أو مثلها. This is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number one, 116. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 106, not 16, 106. Okay. So, uh, and uh, most of the scholars they believe in Nasikh and Mansur, and we should believe in it. So we have it in Quran also. And he mentioned the verse here, I think, yes, chapter 2, number 106, he put the translation of this uh, uh, verse here. How it came about, We as Muslims, we believe in all prophets and messengers, the real one, not the fake one. So we know for sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the rules from one prophet to another. And we read in Quran that Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, he said, I'm here to support uh, all aspects of the Torah and adjust some of it. Okay, And this is for us means nasih. And this has many hikmah, you know. One of the, it, which we should be familiar with it, the graduation, you know, in conveying or in adopting the, the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to use our wisdom, you know, in this regard. So as we know that it happened among the other nations, other communities, other prophets, other messengers, we believe in all of them. They are truthful. They are messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same pattern, it may have happen with one prophet or one community as happened to the Prophet And this, as we said, this has been illustrated. But the hikmah behind it, let's say graduation is one of the major hikmah behind it. Why it's important? For sure, it's important for tafsir purpose, okay? Because uh, we may feel as a verse contradict to the other verse. And we have been instructed by the Prophet ﷺ, don't feel that any verse contradict with the other. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended the Quran to support each other, not to contradict each other. Okay, and here, when we have this contradictory, it's in our mind, not in the reality of the Quran. When we have it in the Hadith, it's our mind, not in the reality of the Hadith. One of the way of expla explaining, explaining this uh, contradiction is by saying this is abrogated. Okay, <laughs> this is not the only way. This is one of the way. Okay, again, as anything you know in this life. You are going to feel, look at people, you know, deal with this point in different attitude. Some, they are going to broaden it a lot. The other, they are going to shorten it a lot, you know. If I want to put it in a simple way, uh, you are going to find some of these verses or some of these ahadith. Majority, all, almost all of the scholars, they said this is abrogated. You are going to find others that may be felt abrogated. The measure they say it's not abrogated and it has this meaning. 
And in the middle, you are going to find the controversial, you know, between the two groups, you know, as expected in any uh, uh, field of Islamic sciences, you know, or life sciences in general nowadays, you know, in, on the earth. You know. And this is reflect for me the majesty of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Okay, anything has been touched or uh, served by the human, you expect to have some controversy. Okay, anything is made completely by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no controversy, no problem. It's going to have the maximum of certainty. وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُ فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا And this again, sorry to keep myself, you know, repeating myself, what, the mountain and those helpers, you know, the, the mountain is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, made for us, you know, and really we are too happy, you know, about it as Muslims, you know, and the other uh, chains, the other factors, the other piece of knowledge, this was maybe Many of them, they initiated from Allah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left to us. So it's human made, you know, in its transmission. And that's why we have the problem, you know, about it. Yes? Sorry. Of Sunnah? This is very, uh, a very knowledgeable person, you know. He passed away was in his 30s, you know. They expect if he lived longer, you know, he will be, his uh, book is called Al-Atibar fi al-Nasikh wal Mansukh min al-Athar. This uh, written by Al-Hazimi. No, Al-Hazimi, not Hamzani. Al-Hazimi. I'm Hamzani. Al-Hamdani, okay. Yes, but Al-Hazimi. Yani his famous name, Al-Hazimi. Okay. This is the most famous one, you know, in general. But this is for the Hanafi will not go with their thoughts, okay? okay? Because as you may see, when I said it's human made, we are going to have different attitude, different opinion of understanding the Nasi and Mansur in the Holy Quran and in the Sunnah Dabir Mutahar. You are going to find some controversy among the scholars, you know, in this regard. Yeah? Uh, about Sunnah? <laughs> yani you may consider, but this is, is much more of uh, yani make the contradiction come together, you know. Not the Nasikh and Mansur. I don't recall any. If you want, if you are interested, I may search for you tonight, you know, because we have this Arisal al Mustadrafa by. Uh, Sayyid Muhammad Ibn Ja'far Kuttani will speak about uh, books written, you know, in Nasikh and Mansur as any other aspect of the Sunnah Nabi Mutahara. Okay, try to find it for you. Other questions? Okay. They said in this uh, book he brought five, 50 different ways, you know, of reconciling. When we, whenever you have the, uh, yani how to, to deal with the ahadith when they sound contradict with each other. He, he, he gave dif 50 different ways, you know, of, uh, he's a very smart and very knowledgeable person, you know. And he passed away, he was too young, you know, subhanAllah. And he has a letter, you know, about the conditions of shurut al aib al-khamsa. Really, I don't feel bored of reading it, and I keep reading it. I read it many times, you know. Even now, I feel myself, I would like to go back and read it, even though nowadays I'm too busy, you know. But really, because it contains mountains of knowledge there, you know, of that person. Whereas when you compare it to someone else, you know, wrote in this subject, you know, you feel the difference. And he was too young, you know, he passed away in young age, this person, subhanAllah. He was in his 30s then, they say, when he passed away. Al-Hazim. Okay, so here, why it's important, Nasikh wal Mansukh, he said, for tafsir, for ahkam sharia, for Islamic laws or Islamic rules, and 
it gives you the graduation and the logical development, you know, of the early days of Islam, which is helpful you when you are da'iyah, how to treat, how to try to reach and communicate with people and make you more, better understand, have better understanding of the seerah of the Prophet Okay, so you have the, the, the two aspects of it, how did the Prophet deal with people and how you should deal with people, you know, in this regard. Okay, and for sure it's going to make you better understanding the, the, the verse itself. How do we know it? Again, I go, he put the first one, report from the prophet or companion. I put before it when the Quran itself said. Okay? When he's, the, Allah subhanahu wa said in the fighting, if you have 20 of you, they are going to defeat 200 of the others. Then the next verse, he said, Allah subhanahu wa make it easy on you now because you have some weakness and make it 1 to 2. The first one was 1 to 10. And so I put, as the scholars, they put, you know, uh, at the first step, they put the Quran always. So in this matter, again, I'm going to put the Quran as the first step. When you have it in the Quran itself, this is going to be to be the most strongest one. Why? Because I'm too happy to say again and again, it's related to the mountain that we are speaking about. Okay. Whereas when you have it, the Prophet وسلم, is mountain and there's nothing similar to him, but the narration to him is not as such. You see, here you have the narration of the Quran, which is a mountain, but the narration of the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ is not as such, okay? That's why we put it in the second step, you know, as we mentioned here, as the author mentioned, when you have report from the Prophet ﷺ or uh, from the companion. For sure, the companion will come after the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because sometimes the companion may say it, because they hear it from the Prophet ﷺ, but other times they say it because they have ijtihad about it. And whenever there's some thinking, some thoughts, some ijtihad about it, you have the possibility of controversy. May the other, other companion may say, no, this is not Mansu. And you have the controversy. And whenever you have the controversy, it makes it in a further step down than the prophetic tradition. Okay? Ijma. Ijma, even though he put it as second here to the report of the Prophet and the report of the companion, and this is the Adam, okay? But Ijma is much stronger. And Ijma is one of the certain and firm knowledge that you get. And they said usually, usually you are not going to have consensus, color consensus or ijma' without a text which we don't know. Okay? Yani here, when you have ijma' that this has been abrogated, most probably there's a text, a report from the Prophet Sallallahu that we are not aware of it, okay? Which make this abrogated. You got this point? In most cases, why? Because as you may see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created people, you know, and everyone has his own idea, his own. We have a lot of differences, even if you are Muslims, even if you are Hanafi, even if you are Sufi, you are going to have a lot of differences, you know, among us. Even though we may share many aspects, you know, but again, we are going to have difference in opinion, we have difference in this and that, okay? So to have all of them making ijma, the expectation, this is not human made. The ijma should be directed from Allah, either from the Quran or from the Sunnah Nabi Mutahar. When we look at the Quran and we don't find anything there, we know that most of these ijma, they have a hidden clue in the 
the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, that may not reach us, you know. And that's why we have Ishma. You got this point? Okay. And here, for sure, in principle of fuqah, in many aspects, you know, of our books, they put the Holy Quran, the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, then Ishma. But Ishma per se, usually it has certainty superior to what we understand from the Quran and the tradition of the Prophet yes. Any question about this point? Okay. <laughs> Knowledge about what, which part of the Quran preceded another part in the history of revelation. And here, this is, we may have some controversy about it, when we feel that there's contradiction with this verse, and the other verse. And we did not have any report from anyone that this abrogated that or that abrogated this. We go by what? By the chronology that we mentioned before. Okay? For sure, the Madani is going to abrogate the Mekki. The uh, last Mekki is going to abrogate the first Mekki, and you name it. You see this point, Yani? Here, it may be working. And that's why. Uh, as I said at the beginning, as any matter of this life, this Nasikh al has been according to some broadening it up, and according to other, it has been modified and shrink, you know, and made, has been made by them the smallest. Okay? Uh, and uh, this is one of the reasons behind it, because some may feel that this verse contradicts with the other and make it abrogate, abrogating the other, whereas the other they may have uh, reco uh, reconciliation about them, you know, reconcile one to, to, to another one. Any question? Then he gave us examples, you know, about it. This is the most famous example about Idda. And this is related to women, okay? All women, they should listen to this, you know, because, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, nowadays, Idda is going down in practice, you know. And we hear a lot of questions. This woman needs this, you know, she, she, shall she go outside her house? And the other one, and the third one felt depressed, and the fourth, <laughs> I don't know, you know. We receive all of these questions, you know. And some of the women, not yours, uh, you people, you know, but the others, they may not care at all about Idda, you know, and they will go outside without seeking permission or fatwa from anyone, okay? So here, for me, it's very bad sign, you know, because I see the practice of this Idda has been going downhill, really, okay? So here, I see this is the wisdom behind leaving this verse in the Quran. This verse, according to majority of scholars, has been abrogated. But we still recite it up till now. What is it? That the Adda used to be one, one year, one complete year. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated it, made it four months and ten days. Okay? This, I feel, I may not be right, I feel that this is a reminder. That we should, should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. It used to be one year, speaking to the woman, and now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it for four months and ten days. And this is, now I remember, this was mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And some of these women, they, they come, came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa seeking some excuse, you know, for the idda. And he, he said, no, because you used to stay for one year, and now it's only four months and, you see, yani this, yani I was asked this question, why this verse still in the Quran, when you say it's abrogated, there's hikmah, there's wisdom, okay? Why it's still there? Just to remind us that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, he cut down the idda from one, year, one complete year to four, four months and ten days, okay? And this, even Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan, since we are speaking about Quran, even Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan was asked, how come you left this verse in the Quran when it's abrogated? Very nice question and very nice answer. Why? Because Sayyidina Osman is going to tell us, I am not the one who, who made the Quran. I don't have the authority to take away or put whatever I like. Okay.
Okay? And that's what he answered that person. When he said, well, how come this is, in, is left in Quran when you believe that this is abrogated? He said, he said this, is, this is not my, my authority to add or take away. The Prophet وسلم, used to have this in this particular place and I cannot move it even. I cannot put it after one verse or before one verse. In its place. Yes. How long? I don't know. I have no idea. You should, you should go back. Alhamdulillah, Ismail is around now, you know. And, uh, because he asked me about the timing, you know, of the hadith. And here you ask me, give me hard time also. Even though we are friends, you know, he keep, keep, keep me, giving me a hard time, you know. Asking me about the time of this verse, you know. To show that I'm jahil, I don't know anything. <laughs> No, feel free. Sorry, I, I don't want to. Okay. So that's why the, the author he started with this example. Okay, and perhaps this is the most famous, most accepted example you know ever. Okay. And to, in my knowledge or in my remembrance, I only remember one person who denied the whole abrogation of the Quran. And when he was faced with this verse, he said, this is for some women, you know, because either their menstruation is going to be delayed and they are going to stay for, uh, for one year if they are in talaq, divorce one. And uh, uh, if, uh, if it's, you are speaking about this, you know, she may be pregnant. And he gave very remote, you know, possibilities for few women that they are going to have idda for one year, you know, he said, if she, she is pregnant, you know, and she has the, the birth, you know, after one year, you know, it's going to be as such. And there's one person, he's not of Ahl Sunnah al Jamaah, he's Mu'tazili. His name is Abu Muslim al Asbahani. They mention him as he has complete denial of abrogation in Islam. Okay, and when he was faced with this verse, he, this was his answer. Okay, and here, as you may see, as anything in this life, we have controversy about certain issue, but one of them, you should have open mind and you should accept the difference between the opinion and the other is quite remote, you know, and quite rare that you don't feel that you accept it a lot, you know. And here Allah subhanahu wa only speak about the woman who is going to get pregnant, you know, and have the pregnancy for one year, which is completely rejected by the modern science nowadays, according to many people. And it's very, yeah, very remote possibility. He mentioned it, you know, in very t detailed way about the idda and you name it. Then he have the title about what is abrogated. According to majority of scholars, you have it in different, uh, four different ways. Quran abrogated by Quran or abrogated by the tradition of the Prophet And then you have Tradition of the Prophet abrogated by the Quran and abrogated by the tradition of the Prophet. This very important point, why? We said Ijma'. Ijma' doesn't abrogate, doesn't abrogate it. It's not abrogated and doesn't abrogate. You see? This very important point. That's why they specify the four types. Why? Because we, they cannot have Ijma' to abrogate or to be abrogated. You cannot have qiyas or analog or any, any other tools or matter, maneuvers, you know, of ijtihad. The only two, they are the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the holy tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes? So the women of the sunnah Yeah, I'm going to give you an example about each one of these four categories. Okay, this is your question, right? That's right, yes. This is, we have consensus about it, or at least the majority of scholars, they said, you cannot abrogate Quran with uh, authentic hadith. 
should be mutawali. Yes, you are completely right about it. Yes. So the first example, Quran abrogates Quran. The example brought, brought by the author in the previous page, you know, about Idda. <laughs> Here you have the verse number 130, 134 abrogates the verse number 145, if I'm not sure, if I'm not wrong, okay? Or 142, 142. The verse number in Surah Al-Baqarah, the verse number 134 abrogates the verse number 142, which is after it. See? Okay. This is the best example of Quran abrogating Quran. Then Quran abrogates Sunnah. What example of it? This is a little bit difficult. What is the example of it? We know by Sunnah that the people in Mecca, they used to face Beit al-Maqdis, journalism. And this is, we know it from tradition. We don't, we don't have any verse in the Quran speaking about it, right? We read it in Sira. This has been abrogated by فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَمِ here you have the Holy Quran abrogates the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See? It's clear. The opposite of it. Sunnah abrogates Quran. When in Surah An-Nisa, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala mentioned Maharim, those women that we are prohibited to get married to them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأَخِلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلْكَ Anything beyond this is permitted. And you have in the sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ made some of the women, again, haram. Okay? Like, and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, to have as two wives, two sisters. And whatever beyond this is permitted. The Prophet ﷺ prohibit us to have the aunt with her niece, okay? This is, has been as abrogation from the Holy Prophet of this verse, وَأُحِلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ وَلْ وَأَحَلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ Two, two style of girl, okay? Both aunts, hmm? both sides, aunts from both sides. Yeah, aunts and niece from both sides, yes. Okay. And then you have Sunnah abrogates Sunnah. This we have a lot of it, a strongest of it, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. And this has been mentioned in one hadith about three matters. كنت نهيتكم عن زيارة القبور على فزور الله. I prohibited you of visiting graves. Go and visit graves. I prohibited you of using certain containers, you know, for drink. Use whatever container you want, but don't drink, uh, what do you call it, beverage, you know, those uh, uh, spiritual beverage, uh, spirit, spirit beverage, yeah, or muscare. Muscare. Intoxicant. Muscare. Yeah. Intoxicant, okay? And I prohibited you of keeping the meat of the Udhiya more than three days, you may keep it for whatever time. Yeah, this, according to the scholar, this is the strongest one when the Prophet ﷺ tell, I did so and now I am changing the rule. Okay? This is the strongest. And it, 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 it came in one hadith about three matters, you know, that was prohibited by him وسلم, and then he, he made them permitted or permissible. So by this, alhamdulillah, we gave examples. For sure, you are going to expect a lot of controversy about many others. You know, perhaps the examples that I gave, no controversy about them. We have some controversy about them. Why? Because some scholars, they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He did not look at the tradition of the Prophet equal to the Quran. So he said, you cannot have abrogation of Quran by Sunnah. This is an opinion, you know. This is a weak opinion, okay, not strong one, okay. You have some scholars, they said, 
and this may relate to Imam Shafi'i even, okay? That you don't ha have the Sunnah, the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam abrogates the Quran. This is an opinion, but as the author mentioned here, majority they go by this opinion, Quran may be abrogated by Quran or tradition, the tradition may be abrogated by Quran or tradition. Then he speak about different type of abrogation in the Quran. Listen, listen to it carefully. He said the first time it's written in your text, abrogation of the recited together with the legal ruling. And we believe that some verses they were revealed to the Prophet and they have been gone away or taken away the recitation of it and the rule of it. Okay. The second type, abrogation of the legal ruling without the resulted verse. What's the best example of it? The idda that we mentioned before. We still recite that verse of idda for one year, but the rule of it has been taken away, has been reduced. The third one is opposite of it, abrogation of the recited verse without the legal ruling, as stoning for the adulteress. This is the example of it. This they used to recite it in Quran. It's not anymore in the Quran, but the ruling of it is still applicable up till now. Okay. We have some scholars, most of them they are in our time, you know, not in the previous time. They will say that there's no obligation of the reciting verse of the Quran. They have this idea, you know, but this is goes against majority of scholars because majority of scholars, they go the way the author went here, okay? And this is, uh, to me, this is the most accurate one, okay? And here, you may feel the Quran of four different types, you know? One is not abrogated by reciting or by ruling, and this is all Quran, most of the Quran nowadays, and you have one abrogated by reciting only, only or abrogated by ruling only, or abrogated by <coughs> reciting and okay? I put it in this way, in four different types, and the first one was put by the four different types, you know. So, uh, whatever you want to have it, or the way you understand it, it's better, you know, put it down. Alhamdulillah, I think the author here, yani, he, he put it in very simple way, Perhaps he did not give examples if you want to write down the examples, unless he brought the examples, you know, after it. He brought the examples. Okay. So he gave example about abrogation of the recitation and ruling. That uh, about ten clear suckling, you know or breastfeeding, you know, uh, to have the mahram, you know, or to have the zawal prohibited. This mentioned by Sayyidina Aisha, and I think it is in Bukhari. Okay, yani here uh, it uh, has very strong yani stand, uh, the author, because always he relate himself, you know, to the authentic, most authentic uh, chain. Then he gave a uh, uh, example of Abrogating the legal ruling without the recited. Okay, that. Inna ahlalna laka azwajaka. It's not clear for me it was abrogated with the other one because I think that say that I should make it in the opposite way. That first firstly come the prohibition and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the permission to the Prophet. Okay? And I think Say Daesh is more knowledgeable than anyone else, you know, in this matter. Because this is related to her, you know. Okay. Then he gave example of uh, abrogation of the Recited without the, the legal ru ruling, 
as narrated by Sayyidina Ibn Abbas or Umar ibn Khattab about the stoning of the adulteress. Okay, this is fam famous khutbah of Sayyidina Umar Khattab, or I would rather say this was the last khutbah of Umar ibn Khattab. He was killed right after it, you know, uh, a few days after it, you know, and this was his last khutbah, and in his last khutbah highlighted many important points, you know, and one of these points was that a people, Alhamdulillah, we did see these people, you know, nowadays, people may come and negate, you know, stoning. They said, we, we read the Qur'an, they are not in the Qur'an. We have stoned, you know, the Prophet وسلم, some of the other adulterers. That's what Sayyidina Umar Khattab said. Then he give, gave this rough estimation. Again, I feel it's controversial, you know. He said, according to Ibn Salama, 43 surahs, they neither have nasikh or mansukh. Six surah with nasikh but no mansukh. 40 surahs with mansukh but no nasikh. A 25 surah with both nasikh and mansukh. I feel that this is number is a little bit too much, you know, because uh, yeah, many scholars, they said roughly the abrogation of the Quran is around 20, not more. Here when you take this number, you are going to find it much more, okay? We have some other scholars, they said 70 verses in the Quran, they were abrogated, you know, by the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us to fight against the mushrik, you know. So here, you have some controversy about it, as I said at the beginning, to what way, we should, to what extent we should uh, uh, broaden, you know, our, our look about abrogation and uh, abrogating matter. Among the, since you like this, you know, always you ask about it, about the mazahib, who is the most one, you know, to consider abrogation among the four mazahabs. Anyone? No one? Your mazahab, Hanafi. Hanafi is the most one to consider abrogation, you know, and say that this is abrogated. Because uh, many of specification or clarification may be called in Hanafi Mazhab as abrogation, okay? And we have certain terminology used by the other specification or clarification or whatever, they call it abrogation. Why? When they call it abrogation, as I received one question, they are going to have the same condition that it should be mutawatir to clarify, to specify that particular ayah. But according to the other scholars, you don't need for clarification or for specification, you don't need tawatur, authentic, authenticity or sound is enough, you know, to make clarification or specification. You see, you see, and this is very important point. With the Hanafi, they consider all of these matters, clarification, specification, and may you have some other, you know, they are considered as abrogation. They are going to have for them the condition of mutawatir. When the other they said it's not abrogation, you don't need to have it mutawatir. You may have it in an authentic chain or sound chain. Okay? That's why I said, you know, that the Hanafi, they are the most one to use the, the term abrogation. Why? Because they broaden it, and by this, the, the conditions to have it made is going to be more difficult. Okay. <coughs> Any question about these points? <laughs> According to Suyut, you said these there are twenty-one instances. And in this those who try to make it narrow, you know, and try to uh, put down the number, you know, of abrogation. I think the least among them, yani, this number is 20, roughly 20, 21, or anything, you know. 
many they go by if you know of the uh, people of Shafi'i. Whereas the Maliki, they broaden it, as I said, one verse, abrogated 70 verses, you know, in the Quran, uh, Ayatul Sayf. Yeah, this is just to give us an idea about how Shah Waliullah, what was the book of Shah Waliullah? Hujjatullah al Baligha. He only said five, five verses, are, they are abrogated. I and mean, this is the first time I came through it, you know. This is much more less, you know, than what Imam Suyuti said. He said only five of them, you know, has been abrogated. Okay. Then he put the, uh, brought this point, I did not expect, between abrogation and specification, okay? And here, other than Hanafi, they show the difference between abrogation and specification. Hanafi, they consider both of them as abrogation, okay? He brought this point, you know, please go back and read it and see if, uh, and he, if he has. And he brought a, an example of it about the two famous verses, you know, the Quran about fasting. Okay. Here, the first one, it sounds as if you are given the choice either to fast or to pay fidya. The second one, make it an obligation on you to fast. So here, some scholars may call the second one as abrogating the first one. And this was mentioned by some of the companions, like say the Salam Ibn Aqwa and others, okay? The other may say, no, it make it specific, specify that those who is going to pay fidya, those who are excused, not everyone. You see? You got this point? Okay? You have the first verse of fasting. It sounded as if you may not fast and pay fidya. Then the other one sounds that you should fast. So some scholars, and this begins from the time of companion, they said the second one abrogate the first one. The other, they said no abrogation here, there's specification that the first one is going to be limited to the excused one, namely the patient, the traveler, uh, the pregnant woman, and you name it. And the other one is for the other people. You see this point? Okay, it's between abrogation and specification. And really, this is one of the major hot topic, you know, in usul al-fuqh between Hanafi and the non-Hanafi in calling the specification as abrogation or not. Yes? Um, if the Hanafis say that this is both abrogation and specification, how do we then derive the ruling that the Shihis are able to walk fast? Because, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to you. Let's assume, even the Hanafi, they said it's specification, okay? And here, the Hanafi will say, in the first verse, let's say this is the group of the Muslims. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave permission for the group of Muslims not to fast and to pay fidya. Okay? When it was specified by the, the other verse that these are the only people that, who are excused, this abrogate the other. This is the abrogation. And has been abrogated for the others. This is the meaning of specification according to Hanif. That this... Let's, say, let's put it in number. This was for, let's say, 50 million person, you know, and now it became for, let's say, 50,000. Okay? And they consider this as abrogation. This is the opinion of Hanafi. 
Other questions? Yes. Any hadith which accept, accepted for any Islamic rules, which uh, if I want to be more uh, specific about it, should be sound or authentic? Authentic or sound? Sahih or Hassan? Other questions? Okay. Now we'll move to this subject, you know, models of what? This is the one you... Inshallah, we'll ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to make it clear, you know, because I'm not that good, you know, in explaining it. This is a very important subject. Those of you who are not interested in fiqh, they may not find it, yani, too important to speak about abrogation, about specification, about this and that, you know, but this is considered one of the major standpoint, you know, that should be understood by all of us, you know, and that's why we should try to, and even if we spend the rest of our time, you know, in this halaqa, you know, speaking about this point, uh, we are not wasting our time, okay? I'll try to simplify it, I'll try to make it understandable, you know, for everyone, but I would like, I'll be too happy, you know, when I have a lot of questions. I mean, to be honest with you, up till now, I'm not that happy because I don't receive questions, you know, except from one or two persons. You know. The other, they listen to me. Either they are too intelligent, you know, they understood everything very, very well, or they did not understand anything. I don't know. So here, sp speaking about the variety of, of moods, and from, war, from where we got it, you know. And this is... In all of our minds, you know, even I received a question in the Q&A, how come the, the scholars, they have this variety on in their uh, principles, you know? And this is question is going to come to any of us. We are called ourselves Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. Yeah. We have the Quran, we have that. From where this variety is going to come? From where we are going to have these differences? You know? And in the same pattern, or perhaps in more stronger way is going to come. You said this is mountain, you know, and now we are telling us about mountains and mountains, you know. How come, uh, can we yani, accept all of these ideas, you know, and uh, try to understand it, okay? I may repeat some of what I've said before, you know, about this point, you know, because we needed to speak about it, uh, how Sayyidina Osman Ma'afad decided to have his copy, you know, of the Quran. Uh, uh, so that's why, I expect all of you to be familiar with what I have said. I may repeat some of them. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to make it uh, understandable to, uh, to everyone. What's the meaning of Al-Ahruf al-Sab'ah? Okay. We have Mutawatir Hadith. And you know the definition of Mutawatir already. We have Mutawatir Hadith that the Prophet وسلم, said, Unzil al Quran ala sabati ahruf. The Holy Quran descended by seven ahruf. What is ahruf? The problem starts here by defining ahruf. Okay, I'm going to wait for a, for a while, you know, to see if the author is going to explain to us and try to give explanation of my, my side, you know, but I want you to feel the problem now, okay? And here we have problem in understanding Ahruf. This is the first problem we are going to face. Problem not always is something bad, okay? Sometimes it's good, you know, just to make you, you know, think and try to uh, analyze and try to understand, you know, okay? Because, mashallah, you are, all of you, you are smart and intelligent, you know, and Allah wants you to, to use your mind and your intelligence as servant of his religion, okay? Not to judge his religion, no, to be servant of his religion. And this is very good area, you know, of using your mind as such. So here, I'm going to repeat it. We have this Mutawatir hadith. 
The Quran descended by, uh, in different seven ahruf. Okay? Even the word harf in Arabic may, me, may mean letter, and by letter it may mean word, sentence, uh, paragraph, okay, all, or uh, 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 gathering you know, or collection of words. It may mean margin, it may mean uh, type. Okay, and that's why you have some or more than some controversy about the meaning of this particular hadith. Whereas it's much more easier to say it's weak, but it is mutawatir. No one has the ability to say it is weak hadith. Okay, we should deal with it and we should for sure to, to know it. It's very important to make us or enable us to know the styles of qiraat that we have today, and why Usman Ma'afan did so, and why so and so said so, and why you have Mus'haf Ubay Ibn Ka'ab, and why of this or that, okay? This is very important, and this is all, all one subject, you know, have many different problems, okay? Those problems, they are, in general, rukhsa for you, make it easy on the Muslims, you know, to recite Quran, and in the meantime, those rukhsa has been abused by the other to attack the Qur'an. I'm speaking about our reality. Okay? Even in one of the halaqa few years ago, I came through what's written. We have different Gospels and the Muslims, they have different Qur'an. <coughs> See to what extent they they abused it. They said even though we have different gospels, you know, and the Muslims they have different Quran. Okay, so that's why it's too important for us to understand this point. Okay. Firstly, since our friend is here, Ismail, will speak about the timing of this hadith, which is too important. Okay, it's too important to speak about the timing of this hadith, and this is going to clarify many points. We derive, this is not mentioned thoroughly or explicitly, we derive that the timing of this hadith took place on the year 8 after conquering Mecca. Why? Because one of the most famous narration of this hadith took place between Sayyidina Amr al-Khattab and Hisham ibn Hakim ibn Hizam. And Hisham al-Hakim ibn Hazam was Muslim at that time. So when did Hisham became Muslim? He, came, he became Muslim after conquering Mecca. So we know for sure that this hadith took place after conquering Mecca. Okay. Let's go from there. Now, alhamdulillah, I hope all of you, you understand part of the problem and you should try to get over it, you know, try to resolve all those subdivisions, you know, of the problem itself. He said the word sab'a means seven. Sab'a ahruf means seven. And ahruf is a plural of harf. Okay? which has many meanings. You see, the problem starts here. Among them, edge or margin, border, letter, word, any, any gathering of the words may be called harf. From the letter, word, sentence, paragraph, Complete talk or lecture. Okay. He did not mention here among them type. One of the meaning of ahruf type. This is taken from the Quran. It's going to worship Allah according to one type 
or one stage, when he's changed to another type or stage, he's going to quit worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Harf means here type or style. Okay? And this is one of the meaning of harf, which is not mentioned by the author. If you want to add it, you may add it here. Okay? Style or type. <coughs> I may disagree with the author. He start to give us, show us the difference between the recitation in North Africa and Jordan. Okay. I would like to leave this to the end. You know, I would like to take the problem. How did it originate? How it was dealt? You know, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, time of Sayyidina Asma al Affan, and in the time of the famous reciters. And in our time, okay? So if you have different idea, you may go well, just look at them, you know, in the way he mentioned. Then he mentioned the language of Quraysh, yes? Uh, which definition of Asr are we choosing? Or which one are we going to? I'm going to try, and here, I don't want to horrify you, you have more than 40 different explanation of Sabah Ahraf, okay? I may summarize them to, for you to seven of them, okay? I'm going to summarize them, you know, but uh, wait a minute, you know, not now. Inshallah, we'll summarize them, okay? Right. So if this is good for you, you may go and read, you know, this example that mentioned by him, you know. I think many, uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Then he spoke about the language of the Quran. As I said before, I'm going to repeat myself because this is a very important point, okay? Firstly, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, who was the first one to speak Al-Fusha? Fusha is the most, I don't know how to translate, eloquent, yani, or perhaps not eloquent exactly. Yani, that means the most fine and nice la Arabic language, okay? And here, as British people, person, you know, when the Americans they speak, you feel this is very bad, yani, ugly language or whatever. You feel preference of your language. Okay, so here, fusha, and if we want to say, even in Arabic, you have different accent. The most fine and beautiful one of it, you may call it fusha. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, who was the first to speak this fusha? And he related it to Ismail, Sayyidina Ismail, the grand great father of him, sallallahu alayhi wa Okay? How? How? You know, what was the original language of Sayyidina Ibrahim? Syrian, Syriani. This was the original language of Sayyidina Ibrahim. When he was saved of the fire, he passed over the river from Iraq to Syria. Passed over in Arabic and in Hebrew. May, uh, you use the word, word Abara. Okay, Abara, that is passed over the river. We read, yeah, this is history information. I don't know how accurate it is, not Quran, okay? That they sent someone to kill him, you know. They told, you, you search for a person, speak Syrian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed his language, make it Hebrew, Ibri, or Arabic. Because Abara and Araba, they are almost the same, okay? Yani his language has been changed to what called nowadays Hebrew, Abara, or Arabic, or close to these two languages. 
And for sure he learned it, or he taught it to his son Ismail. His son Ismail left in Mecca to have mixture of what he learned from his father and what learned from the old Arab. We have very old Arab in Yemen. The last one of them was the tribe of Jurhum, called Jurhum. Those people, they resided in Mecca, and for sure they affected Ismail in his language. And here, Ismail, Sayyidina Ismail has the mixture of two languages, the very old Arabic and the whatever Abara or Araba or Hebrew or Arabic, you know, of Sayyidina Ibrahim, he has the mixture of them, you know. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said he was the first one to speak the most fine and the most eloquent, the most uh, beautiful Arabic language. Is it clear? Any question about it? I was smiling. <laughs> then as you may know, from history and from Syria, we know it in particular in Syria. Some of his children, they resided in Mecca, the same city, and the other day start, go out in Arab Peninsula and elsewhere. Some they went to Syria and Iraq. Okay? So this, as you may expect, is going to create different accents of the same language as happened when English, with English, when they went to U.S., when they went to Australia and other areas, okay? The language is going to be the same originally, but in different accents. Here you have the same thing, you know, his children, their language has different accents. And bearing in mind, not all Arabs, they, really, they are the children of Ismail, they got mixed with other Yemeni people, you know. And they are going to have some change in their accent and some, some change in their language, okay? Those people in Mecca may, may be as the people nowadays, not as the others. And everyone else is going to be secluded in his region and in his area and his tribe. Whereas these people in Mecca, they are exposed to everyone. Why? Because everyone is going to come to Mecca to perform Umrah, to perform Hajj. And we read about the markets surrounding Mecca, you know, Uqaz, Mijanna, Zul Majaz, and, uh, and many others. You have the large markets, you know, and the, the large shopping take place around Mecca, you know, the, these early days, you know. This tell me that the people of Mecca, they used to get the largest and the broadest exposure to the Arabic accents. This has two factors. The first factor is going to refine and make their language the most beautiful and the most accepted one. Okay? Because those smart people, they are going to select from each, each language the best pronunciation and the most fine word wording. On the other hand, it's going to make their, their language much more known to the others. You see? And nowadays, if you are assigned for a business, you know, in France, and you have time, you try to go to, to, to learn some French language, right? Here, all Arab in the, in the old days, they should go to Mecca for Umrah or Hajj. So they should be familiar with this language or this accent, let's say. Okay? So you see, this has two components, as, as I said. The first component to make their accent is the most fine and the most beautiful one. And the other one to make it more known to the other Arab. But not, not to the extent, you know, to make it known for everyone, as you may expect. So this was the Qurayshi, we call it Qurayshi language, because 
the most famous tribe to be to reside in Mecca from the time of Khin Ismail till the time of the Prophet was Qabila to Quraysh. Okay? You have some other people, they resided in Mecca in different times, but, but this is the most prominent person, you know, to stay in Mecca from the time of Sayyidina Ismail till the time of the Prophet And as you may expect, you know, in, in anything in this life, when we drive, let's say, from one city to another, we are not going to find all of a sudden, you know, complete change. That's why the people surrounding Mecca, they are familiar with the uh, Quraysh language, okay? Yani in Hijaz, let's say Hijaz, the whole region of Hijaz, they are similar, not exactly the same, they are similar and familiar with the accent of Quraysh. They may have some differences, but we expect to have minor differences, you know, in this region. When we go further, when you go east, when you go south, you are going, or north, you are going to find much more difference, you know, than what you have in the Hijaz per se. Okay? So the Hijaz region, you know, of the Arab Peninsula, Peninsula, they were, most of them, they were familiar with the Qurayshi accent, you know, and they know it, and we now know that this was one of the most beautiful acts, Arabic accent, you know. This regard. Any question about these points? No questions. Sorry, you mentioned there's a well in Mecca. Is Durham covered than the Linda? Yes. In terms of the other wells, how did the people of Mecca survive without water then? Yeah. If you go to see that Ibn Hisham, he mentioned about the wheels, you know, in Mecca and the surrounding. We have a lot of wheels, alhamdulillah. Allah is not going to stop, you know, providing people, you know. They have a lot of wheels. And uh, we have a lot of the names, yani. I, I don't, perhaps I don't remember them, you know. But in my, what I, I remember, you know, you have more than 20 wheels, you know, in Mecca and surrounding. Yes. Maybe who were the, who the second most prominent? Okay, as you may expect, this is a good question, you know. Those who are surrounding Mecca, okay, yani what, one of the most famous tribe, you know, uh, who is considered as very important for the Arabic language is Huzayl. This is the tribe of Sayyidina Allah bin Mas'ud. And they used to be in the surrounding of Mecca, okay. And this is one of the most يعني, beautiful or eloquent or whatever you want to go. يعني, when you read in the story of Imam al-Shafi'i, he read Ash'ar al uh, uh, Ibn Hisham read Ash'ar al on Imam al-Shafi'i. This is to tell you how knowledgeable is Imam al-Shafi'i in Arabic language, okay? That this famous author of Sira, Ibn Hisham, he read the poem of Huzaliyin collection of the poem of the Huzaliyin, he read it completely on Imam al-Shafi. And this, for me, tells that those people, they were, it used to be eloquent, you know, and uh, have the, this language. But this is not the only one. You have many other, uh, not many, a few other names, you know, in this regard. And we'll come to, to speak about them when we speak about Sabat al ahram Because one of the opinion of Sabat al that this is related to seven different tribes, you know, in Mecca and Saram. Yes? Yeah, the, the tribes were like in the, the West, 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 some words from the other Arab tribes, you know, language or accent, you know. But in general speaking, the common trend, you are right, yani. Even the famous poems, you know, of non Qurayshi tribe, you know, of other tribes, even they, though they may be too far of Mecca, 1,000 kilometers or more, they used to form the poem in general in the Qurayshi accent because it became 
the most famous and most accept acceptable la accent you know among the Arab. And as I said before, we speak about muallaqat. What the those who were uh, they, which were hanged, you know, those the most, seven most famous, you know, poem in Arabic language. They hanged it in the Kaaba. I think in the same pattern, you know, place wise, you take it tongue wise. And that, what I mean by this that they try to make their language, you know, according to the Quraysh language in their poem. Yes, your question is roughly, I say 90% is right, you know, but not 100%. Because even in this poem, or even in the Quraysh language, you may find some words, you know, which is not of the Quraysh accent. Other question about Quraysh language? This remind me and everyone, go back and recite and try to understand the ilafi Quraysh ilafi. You have special surah in Quran titled Surah Quraysh. Okay? Go back and try to understand. Okay? Right. Then he sp spoke about the seven modes. He said this has been narrated by more than ten. I think the number is two down, you know. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact figure, you know. We have collection of the number, but in my expectation, expectation is going to be above 20. Okay, 10, is, I don't think this is the number, okay. And at the time of Sayyidina Uthman Ma'afan, as I told you before, everyone in the mosque, they stood, stood up that they hear this from the Prophet We may not have the chains of all of these narrations, you know, but to best of my knowledge, nowadays, I'm going to check it for you, inshallah. I did not be, uh, forget, you know, we have more than 20 different uh, different names of the companions. You may, you, as you may know, <laughs> some of the companions, they may have two chains or three chains or four, okay? And here we are speaking about the names of the companion. To best of my knowledge, you have more than 20 names of different companions of this. Here, he put it as 10, you know, I, I feel 10 is a little bit low number. We have more than this. Okay. So uh, uh, as we said at the beginning, this is Mutawatir Hadith, and he brought it here to, to tell us that this is Mutawatir. He brought one narration from Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas, and another one for Sayyidina Umar and Hisham ibn Hakim. And third one of Salman. Okay. So basically, all these incidents, I'm going to try to summarize, you know, what mentioned the hadith. You are going to find difference and some type of argument between two companions or three. And everyone is going to say, I took this from the Prophet And they will go back to the Prophet And the Prophet will tell them, Unzil al-Quran ala sallallahu We are right, we are right, we are right. Everyone is right, you know, because, not because they are right, because they read on the Prophet This is a very important point, okay? And that, that, that this point, I would like everyone to, high, uh, to be highlighted very well, okay? Because this has been misunderstood, not only by non-Muslims, by some Muslims is not understood. Some scholars, the Muslim scholars, they don't understand, understand this point. Why did the Prophet whenever they have any controversy and they come to him, they say, you are right and you are right. Not because they initiated it from this, their side, because they read it on the Prophet And this is the most important about the variant, variety of modes that you have, okay? What is the most important one in there? To match that this is, was descended from Allah, okay? And for example, I'm going to give you an example. Any text you take it from Quran, According to Arabic language, you may pronounce it in different ways. Five, six, seven, eight ways, you know. All these ways, 
they are not accepted. Unless you bring me the chain that you have read it on the Prophet وسلم, and he approved it. You see, you see this point? The Prophet said, descended. Yeah, and this has been initiated, started from Allah through Sayyidina Jibreel, through the Prophet وسلم, and we don't consider any style, any type, any qira'a, we call in Arabic, unless you have your chain to the Prophet وسلم, that this has been recited on the Prophet وسلم, and approved it. Okay? Yeah, and again, when you look at the possibilities in Arabic language, you are going to have a plenty of possibilities, you know, of different way of recitation or, or anything, okay? So, the most important thing about it, to be recited in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ with his acceptance. Okay? And that's for us what differentiates Qira'a from the other possibilities that are good. Okay, and even though the Quran has been Arabic, but there is some Arabic accent not accepted in Quran at all. Okay, yeah, and if you certain letters, the way it's pronounced, it's not permitted. I should speak this, you know, because nowadays we have something different. And to say al mustaqim this Arabic accent. But never happened in the Quran. Was not never accepted in Quran. There's some few tribes, you know, they say al mustaqim Gala, Gulna, Kulnalo. But this is never in the Quran. No one has any chain to the Prophet وسلم, that he permitted this to be pronounced in this way. This is Arabic, but not Quran. Okay? What I'm trying to say. You may have many Arabic, different possibilities, but you cannot call them Quran till you have the approval that this is, has been narrated in front of the Prophet <laughs> This is very important point. This point is not clear for many people, many Muslim, many scholars of Islam, not in this day, in the early days. Even you have some Mufassirin, they mention in the, this, their book something, you feel that they don't understand this point very well, okay? This is very important point. This is, yani, how do you get this? You get it from the specialized person, that specialized in recitation, not in our time. Let's speak about Nafi and Asim, those famous reciters, you know. You are going to find them. Why they got that, this fame? Because they were the most, restricted people about what they have heard. One time I was given, you know, in the Fatih University to teach about these seven, you know, famous reciters to give tarjama about their hayat. And what paid my attention a lot, how they were restricted, you know, to what they have learned, you know. And perhaps that's why they became that famous, you know. So again, to make the long st story short, the most important component and condition in Qira'a, or to have its style of recitation, to have the chain to the Prophet, that this is was recited in front of the Prophet The possibilities, they are a lot. The accents, they are a lot. <coughs> but all of those accents and possibilities, they are not to be accepted. I would rather they say they are rejected Unless you have the proof about your chain. I think we'll stop here. We'll have break for 15 minutes and we'll get back for the other. This is very important for the last point, you know, if you want to understand the seven variant, you know, modes or whatever, you know, this, in my opinion, this is the most important point that should be understood. That the Prophet said, Unzila. What's the meaning of Unzila? And this descended from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel to the Prophet sallallahu And not the opposite, not I am initiating it or I started, I begin it from my side. No, it should be come from up down. I am in the, at the bottom, okay? Unzila, that's me, it's come to me from up, okay? I don't initiate it. 
not myself. Any human is considered as down. Okay? He, can, he doesn't have the authority. Even with full and high respect, even Sayyidina Usman, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Thabit, all other companions, they don't have the authority. And that's why when they had the problem during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu what they tend to do, he will not say, I am companion, I have the full authority to do whatever I, no. He will take him to the Prophet. Ask the Prophet, have you instructed the so-and-so to read this? If the Prophet says yes, then no one has any right to say any, any word. If the Prophet, by assumption, this never happened. If the Prophet said no, it's not going to be accepted by one, anyone. It's going to be rejected by everyone. You see, this is very, very, very important point. This point, as I said, is not clear for some of the authors, you know. You may find it in the book, but for sure you are not going to find it in a book of Qira'at, okay? Those who are specialized in Qira'at, they know this point very well, you know. The others, other scholars, some Mufassirin, some Arabic language uh, uh, scholars, some others, this idea may not be that clear in their thoughts or in their writings. That's why you may find in the Islamic library someone speaking vice versa, okay? As you, I expect, as you expect, we should take anything from the, the one who is specialized in it, which who are the Qurra in this matter, you know, the, the reciters of Qurra. Alhamdulillah, this was started by Sayyidina Osman ibn Affan when he was asked about something and he said, no one has any right to, to, to have any interference in Qur'an. Okay, and this goes with the way we understand these uh, different narration about Unzil al-Qur'an ala sabbatah. Okay, think about this point a lot, you know. Any question? If there, yes? Because they are not gods, you know, we are deficient, okay? Yani, uh, uh, any one of us, without exception, is going to be good if he work hard, is going to be good in his specialty, but in the other specialties, he's not going to be as good. Because we cannot, and, and I think you feel it in yourself and in myself. Whatever I come through every day, I'm going to be familiar with it and more specialized in it than the matter that I read it once or twice or ten times. I'm not going to be the same or equal in both of them, you know. Yani the, our exposure is going to be completely different. And if I want to broaden your matter a, a little, you know, we spoke about Al-Hazimi, one of the pioneer matters that the Hajit Hazimi put, you know, that the selection of Bukhari about the narration, narrators, you know, in his book is not only by having the one who is pious and he's, he knows the art of narration. No, he add on it the long company. Of the meaning of the long company. And when you have this stu student with his sheikh for 50 years sitting with him, is this one is going to e be equal to the one who visited this sheikh and sat with him a few days? It's impossible. And this answer your question. And this is me, uh, this is the meaning of specialty, okay? The one, yani they used to say in Azhar, you are familiar with Jamia al Azhar in, back in Egypt, you know. Some of these shuyukh, you know, when they come, the, the student come to read fuqh on them, he memorized the whole book, you know, in his mind. Because he read it to the student and explained it 60, 70 times, okay? He will not ha hold the book, you know, in, even with, in his hand. And this story, you hear it. But if this particular person, you ask him about another book in Fuqh al-Shafi, he may not be that good, you see? And this is a specialty, okay? So this is explained to you why some of our scholars, highly respected, you know, in all time, and this is written in some book of tafsir and uh, some book of Arabic language, this statement is completely wrong when they feel that 
the, the reciter of the Quran or the narrator of the recitation has the full right to choose, you know, whatever is applicable in Arabic language. This is not the case. The major component that we should look at would change to the Prophet And uh, the Prophet he initiated it when he said, Unzila. The Quran descended. And we are all down under the umbrella of the Quran, including the companion. No one has any authority, and this was mentioned by Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Other questions? We'll stop here for 15 minutes, inshallah.